Hello, I'm Chelsea Wong, and my research is titled Opportunity Zones, Lessons Learned and Lost from Empowerment Zones. Everyone knows that one city, the city that's too deeply entrenched in poverty and unemployment to ever grow economically on its own without a miracle. In 1992, the calls for help were heard to enact the first federal place-based economic policy in the U.S. These were the Empowerment Zones. But like most government programs, it had its shortcomings. In 2017, the government decided to evolve the idea and create the Opportunity Zones. To what extent have the OZs learned its lessons from the EZs? And are they the answer to America's poverty crisis? The aptly named Empowerment Zone program aspired to uplift communities in areas of poverty, unemployment, and real estate. The academic response to these zones were mixed. In general, there were no significant gains on any of the three goals that would justify the cost of this program to the federal government. Program limitations could account for this lack of real change. One, the program did not encourage sustainable economic development. Two, the program did not control for population migration. And three, there were no added incentives for investors, specifically in EZs, so funds and therefore projects were limited. Fifteen years later, we have the Opportunity Zones, which offer the three main benefits seen here. Temporary deferral of tax, step up in basis, and permanent exclusion of capital gains tax on accrued gains. So with that in mind, did the OZs resolve the EZs problems? Well, yes and no. This new program did target longer investment with increasing benefits, so it is promising on the sustainability front. Plus, it offered direct incentives for private investors to fund OZs specifically, so this could create a cycle of investment. However, it not only did not offer any controls for population migration, but I suspect it might have worsened the risk because it removed the rigorous process for project approval. So now we look at the OZs on its own. In its short lifetime, it has garnered a lot of attention, from research institutes to news outlets like the New York Times. The issues boil down to the following. Minimal impact on community, widening investment pool without oversight, gentrification risk, and inappropriate designation of zones. What can we do? We do not have the data due to the removal of the Treasury Regulation Clause during its absorption into the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, but from this alone, we can make recommendations to shape legislation in a way that would better serve its goals. I recommend that the government reinstate Treasury regulations of reporting to Congress the program's outcomes and reporting annually to the public after five years of enactment, and require state control applications for development projects before Opportunity Zone funds are dispensed. So let's bring it back to the city we know. By using a comparative analysis to assess the Opportunity Zones, we can become more informed on what the program actually does for the city what faults we should be cautious of, and of course, whether it has learned or lost its lessons from the empowerment zones.